Uh, good afternoon. I think we could um, perhaps begin. We are, well, just a few minutes late. Um, so the, this afternoon's session is um, the impact on arts. And um, first of all, I would like to uh, congratulate Diane and the team for putting together such a, a wonderful day and a reflective day. Uh, I'm Mary Canning and I took over as president of this academy on um, March the 20th, 2020. So, um, I had a lot of the kind of challenges that we heard about this morning going on Zoom, etc., and learning it rather fast. Um, reflecting on the arts, we're going to have three uh, really, uh, I think, great reflections on that. I'd like to start off by just framing it. For me, one of the, the, um, the images of those months when we sat at home and looked at everything on television or on streaming, was seeing one of our great mezzo-sopranos, Celine Byrne. No, Tara Erucht, actually, our mezzo-soprano, standing on her own on the floor of the National Concert Hall, singing to an empty stage, to an empty audience, with Dervla Collins on piano beside her. And their careers had been completely upended. Um, their lives had been completely changed, and yet they went on giving us the kind of support that we needed during those months. So the arts were impacted, and yet they were there for us. And if ever we wanted to know that they were important, it was for our society, and whether it was normal people, or whether it was whatever your favorite was, this was keeping us going. So it's against that background this afternoon that we are going to hear uh, reflections on the theater, reflections on cinema, and then reflections on the media reporting and metaphors in the media reporting. Um, our first speaker this afternoon is Patrick Lonegan, uh, University of Galway, member of the Royal Irish Academy. Uh, Patrick is Professor of Drama and Theatre Studies at the University of Galway and is indeed a member of the Academy, as I've said. He has published many books about Irish theatre and literature, and his latest book, Theatre Revivals for the Anthropocene, will be published this summer. And Patrick is also the chair of the uh, board of the Galway International Arts Festival. Um, and thank you very much, Patrick, for taking it. Nice. Technology sources. Um, OK, good afternoon, everybody. It's, it's great to be here to talk to you uh, about theatre and about the pandemic, um, partly because, and I, I wanted to start by saying this, in many ways, the history of Western theatre is also a history of plagues, of disease. Um, so going right back to the start, you think about something like Sophocles' Oedipus Tyrannos. Uh, this is a drama, very famously, in which the hero kills his father, marries his mother. And so what happens? The gods send a plague to the city of Thebes as a punishment. So drama about that. In the early modern period then, the career of this fella, Shakespeare, was really marked by plague, by pandemic, in all sorts of ways. It shut down the theatres, sending his company out on the road. Also forced people into lockdown, so I think it's highly likely that many of the plays he wrote, he wrote during periods of lockdown. So in such a context, if you think about, you know, the apocalyptic mood of something like King Lear, it makes a new kind of sense. Uh, think about what Lear says to his daughter, um, and you really get the sense of the intensity of his anger here. But yet thou art my flesh, my blood, my daughter, or rather a disease that's in my flesh, which I must needs call mine. Thou art a boil, a plague sore, an embossed carbuncle in my corrupted blood. Yeah, fathers and their daughters. Um, Imagine saying that in front of an audience where everyone in the audience knew somebody who had suffered from plague. They knew what that meant. They had seen that with their own eyes. Think of how visceral that was. 
bit closer to our own times, think about how uh, in the late 19th century, Ibsen in Ghosts was addressing the prevalence of syphilis in Europe in that period in the late 19th century, um, causing one reviewer at the time to call it, and I love this, a, a loathsome sore unbandaged, a dirty act done publicly. So using the language of contagion to talk about a play that is about contagion. Then more recently in the contemporary period, you can think about how the AIDS crisis in the 1990s in particular brought us the play Angels in America by Tony Kushner, which really is one of the great dramas of our time. So we've been talking a lot today about how we're going to look back at the COVID pandemic, how we're going to think about its impact. And of course, that's a conversation in theatre as well. I think we still have an opportunity to shape that narrative. Uh, to define what the impact on theatre will be. And what I would suggest is we have the opportunity by learning some lessons to ensure that this is another one of those turning points, like the ones that gave us Sophocles and Shakespeare and Ibsen, turning point for the theatre, but also potentially for the wider society as well. Theatre, of course, one of the things that it does is it puts bodies into space in close proximity with each other. And for that reason, it was extremely vulnerable during the pandemic. It was often said it was the first to close, last to reopen afterwards. And it still hasn't recovered, just to be frank about it. There are still lots of problems there. Audiences have returned in some cases, but are not fully back yet. A lot of people left the profession and have not come back and probably won't come back. Um, so there are problems there. And, you know, being frank about it, the best thing any of us can do for the Irish arts generally is go out, buy a ticket for something, go to it, and then tell all your friends to do the same thing. Um, it needs that kind of practical ongoing support. So in talking about some of the positive things that we can learn about it, I don't want to overlook the fact that it's coming from that negative position, but partly because things have been negative, I think we need to find some of those positive lessons. So I'm going to talk about three broad kind of trends uh, in theatre during the pandemic that I think we can learn from. And the first is Zoom performances. And so this was kind of happening a little bit anyway. We had seen the National Theatre in Britain, Met Opera in New York, were doing live streaming of performances uh, to cinemas all around the world. So that had been happening beforehand. And then simultaneously online, we were starting to see a lot more uh, use of things like YouTube or Instagram or TikTok for, I guess, amateur forms of performance. So really interesting case study is Ratatouille the Musical, which happened first on TikTok before moving to Broadway. And it was essentially a crowdsourced musical that people developed on TikTok. So in the international case, that's really interesting. Here in Ireland, we were starting to think about that stuff as well. So just before the lockdown happened, for the very first time, an Irish company, Druid Theatre, were do going to do a live broadcast uh, from the stage to cinemas all over Ireland. And you can see from the screen there, that was scheduled for the 5th of March. You know, so very late just before the lockdown. Um, but one of the interesting things about that is because Drood had innovated in that way, because they were the first to do this in Ireland, that meant that when the pandemic happened, it was easier for them to move into live streaming, not to cinemas, but straight into people's homes. So they did that with things like a, an Evan Boland piece with Colm Tobin and Tom Kilroy's adaptation of The Seagull, another Chekhov play. So I think there's a lesson there straight away. And the first is that the Irish companies that fared best during the pandemic were the companies that had already been innovating, that already needed to be flexible. And I'll be talking quite a lot about that. But the second thing, and maybe more immediately for Druid, is that these, uh, the live streaming stuff worked best when it captured the sense of liveness that we get in a theatre space. A great example of that was during the streaming of Sonia Kelly's play, Once Upon a Bridge. First night went well, second night went well, but eventually they, they had technical problems during the run. People at home were seeing that the, the audio was out of sync with the picture and they had to stop, put up a message, fix the technical problem, and then go from the very start again for something that people had paid money for. You might say, you know, audiences would be outraged. They'd say, this is unprofessional. We paid, didn't happen. 
on the contrary, audiences were delighted. Uh, they were supportive, they were encouraging. You probably can't read those, some just examples from Twitter there, um, of how people reacted. And it was something to do with the fact that because something had gone wrong, they felt more connected to the performance. And this, you know, it makes a lot of sense to me because this was a time in our lives and in our society when we all felt that something had gone wrong. So it made sense that people were inspired by Drood saying, you know, let's fix the problem and get the show back on again. But I think it was also interesting how hungry audiences were, not just for the sense of sharing an experience that you have in a live context, and this is true for music and sport as well, but it is actually that thing that the person on the trapeze wire might fall or the technology might fail. Um, in other words, the liveness of a thing is partly to do with our shared vulnerability. And again, that's what people wanted to feel. Lots of other great examples of Zoom performances throughout the country. I'll mention quickly, probably one of my favorite was from Big Telly in Belfast, where they did uh, Macbeth um, over Zoom. So this was done with five actors uh, in their different Zoom rooms. Um, five actors playing all of the characters, and you would know which character they were playing because the Zoom background would change. Great example, as directed by Zoe Seaton, of how Shakespeare and theatre more generally is often at its most pleasurable when it's also at its most playful. Like Macbeth is a spooky play, but it can also be fun. And they had fun with it by using this technology. But again, and crucially, the reason Big Telly were able to do this with such excellence so early on is because they'd already been innovating with online platforms. Lots of other great examples from the Abbey and Irish National Opera and indeed throughout the country. Um, but I want to move to the second major strand and this is how a lot of theatre companies moved their work outdoors. Often to settings where there was very strong natural beauty or architectural beauty or sometimes both. So you see their Druid Theatre in Cool Park. Now, again, a lot of Irish companies had been doing this anyway. If you're from Cork, you'll know about Cork Adorca, who did great work outdoors. Uh, Rough Magic, likewise, in Dublin and Kilkenny. Drood um, staged the works of Lady Gregory in Cool Park, where Lady Gregory lived, so bringing that plays back to their source. But they also brought them to places like Kylemore Abbey here in Connemara. And you can see there just how beautiful that setting was. And it was really wonderful to be out there and see the plays in that context. But it could be politically powerful as well. So in Kilkenny, uh, they staged an adaptation of Tom Kilroy's novel, The Big Chapel. And it was performed mostly by the, the people who lived in Callum itself. So this is really important. It's about their past. It's people who are living there coming together to tell this story about their own history. And again, think about this, at a time when we'd been locked down and separated and socially distanced, this was an expression of the idea of how important community is and how we can face the past together. I wanna spend a couple of minutes though talking about a particularly good example of this, and that was the Abbey Theatre's um, stage adaptation of Patrick Kavanagh's poem, The Great Hunger, which was performed or recited by actors um, around the grounds of the Irish Museum of Modern Art, or IMA. So I'm sure some of you know the poem. Uh, it's very famous, written in the 1940s, for using the metaphor of hunger from the Great Famine of the 1840s to think about the hunger that people felt in the 1940s as a result of the impact of enforced celibacy. They were starving for intimacy in Kavanagh's poem. So there's a lot to say about this. I'm going to focus uh, really briefly on two parts that might explain why this was relevant at a time of pandemic. And while doing that, I'm going to just play a little bit of this so you can see what it was like. First of all, this poem is inherently theatrical because Irish society is itself inherently theatrical. And um, so the protagonist of the poem, this guy Patrick Maguire, he feels like he's on stage all the time. Um, he feels like he's under scrutiny. He feels that the people he lives around are like characters as they promenade to mass or the pub or school. But the tragedy of his life, the thing that makes the poem so tragic at its end, is that when he comes close to death, he realizes that in his life there has been no drama. 
So there's a repeated line in there, applause, applause, the curtain falls. And it's so moving because there isn't really anything to applaud in his life. So it's a poem that's saying, you know, performance is really important for who we are, how we see the world, how we think about things. But it's also doing the thing of locating the pandemic in this historical context. You know, looking back to the 1940s, saying that people overcame that. Looking back to the famine, saying people overcame that too. Making COVID seem like another cyclical challenge that we survived. The second important feature is what Kavanaugh is doing with metaphor. And you can stop their video. There we go. Um, what he does with metaphor, and particularly what he does with natural metaphors. So if I can generalize very quickly, in poetry, often when people refer to nature, uh, they use it as a metaphor for the human. So they're not seeing the natural world uh, as interconnected with the human. It's more like a kind of a, a backdrop. So, you know, you think about Shakespeare saying, well, I compare you to a summer's day, or Wordsworth wandering lonely as a cloud, or Emily Dickinson saying hope is the, the thing with wings. So in all of these cases, nature is a symbol, it's a metaphor, it's not a thing in itself. Kavanaugh does that too, but what he also does is he shows that nature is doing to us what we're doing to nature, that we are marked by the natural world too, by the passing of the moon or the sun or the seasons, by birds, by animals, and so on. So just look at those, uh, those great lines in the poem there. Nobody, he writes, will ever know how much tortured poetry the pulled weeds on the ridge wrote before they withered in the July sun. So Kavanaugh is giving us this version of the natural world in which the human and the non-human are interconnected with each other. So humans might see nature as a symbol, but he's saying, well, actually, weeds too can write poetry. So again, this was so important because during the pandemic, apart from the fact that many people rediscovered nature, as they said at the time, the pandemic was about our ecological interconnection with other living things, including viruses, and showing that we're not the masters of the universe, but we're part of this system and vulnerable within this system. And so what Kavanaugh's poem is doing is it's reminding us of that. So the Abbey go back in time and they, they go to a classic Irish text and they find a meaning in it that Kavanaugh himself could never have imagined. He didn't write a poem about pandemics. He didn't write a poem about climate change. But those meanings are there anyway. And it's a great example of the capacity of Irish art to provide what Seamus Heaney once called symbols adequate to our predicament. And so what these kinds of performances were doing was giving us those symbols. Last thing I want to talk about is how the pandemic broke down a lot of barriers between art forms and in other ways as well. And as a kind of case study, I'm going to talk specifically about the 2021 Galway International Arts Festival because it was a pandemic festival. So it was done in such a way as to follow the rules um, that had been enforced at the time. So one very good example, Luke Murphy's four-part dance piece, Volcano, um, really interesting piece that skews the difference between the real world and the virtual. Um, I don't know if you can see this very clearly, but you'll notice that the audience members were in individual booths. So you're in this booth by yourself, listening to the performance by headphones, wearing a mask, and looking at it through plexiglass. Now that was important for health reasons, but what it also did is it isolated the audience member in a way that was actually very relevant to the piece's themes. And so it was like a reminder of what happens when you go into the virtual world. You know, you, your sense of smell, your sense of touch becomes irrelevant. All you have is what you see. Um, so really powerful investigation of where we were. Another good example in the Irish language was Brew Theatre's Arash Arish. So for that show, audiences met at the River Carib in the city, and they would wear virtual reality headsets that brought them first to Kashla in Connemara, which you see on the screen, then to the top of a mountain, again in Connemara, and then to a therapist's waiting room. And while they did that, they were interspersing it with texts by Marcino O'Kine and Parikh O'Connora and Nula Nigonal. So they're taking writers and texts that are often seen or maybe even dismissed as being traditional or old fashioned and filtering them th through this very cutting edge advanced technology. And it's kind of saying this idea that, you know, things are linear, that we move from the primitive to the progressive. 
isn't really true. Things move in cycles. And the title said, Arash Arish, here we are again. It's us again, you know, that, that sense of being back again. Another important Irish language text, Leighton the Sunna, uh, an adaptation of Beckett's Happy Days, which was performed on Inish Ear, and where they made Winnie's mound out of those limestone flagstones that are characteristic of the island. So you can see how that was performed there, um, Winnie emerging almost out of the landscape there. And again, doing really important work. A lot of academics will say that Beckett, when it comes to Ireland, he outgrew Ireland, he transcended Ireland, he surpassed Ireland. But by bringing his works back to Aaron and staging it as Elga, we see that actually he makes a lot of sense rooted in that context. So you might say it's Beckett, but it's also Arash Arish Arish. Here we go again with the cycle going around. The last example I want to talk to you about, it's not theatre, uh, but for reasons that I hope will be clear, it's also not not theatre. And this is John Gerard's Mirror Pavilion, which was um, done first beside the River Carib in, uh, in Galway. So it's an enormous reflective cube that you can see there, uh, reflecting back the environment in front of it, but also giving us these figures who perform on it. Um, then it was moved out to Derry Gimla Bog in Connemara for uh, another performance. And what's really important about this is, you know, when people talk about Connemara, they always say, oh, it's unspoiled, it's so natural, it's so beautiful. But when you dig into the history, you realize that there's huge traces of human intervention there. So Derry Gimla Bog was the place from which the first um, transatlantic radio signal was sent by Marconi, and also the place where Alcock and Brown's transatlantic flight set down in 1919. And so this leaf figure that I'm going to show you now is performing a kind of lament for the impact of those two technologies. Let me just mute uh, there so you can continue to watch. Um, so um, what's really important about this anyway is, again, it's blending traditional culture with a lot of other things, very advanced technology there too. That's not a video. What's actually happened there is motion captured uh, dancers recorded stuff that was turned into data and the data observes the movement of the sun and then matches it. So you'll see in a minute how the leaf figure uh, casts a shadow that actually matches the sun in the sky. So it's environmentally responsive. It's live even though there's nothing living about it and doing really interesting stuff there ecologically too. Okay, I've got about 30 seconds left so I'm going to finish with some conclusions. First thing to mention, really important to say that so much of the pandemic drew on Irish language performance and culture. Um, don't really have time to think about why that was. Possibly it was because we were less focused on international touring and it made space. But isn't it interesting that the questions so many of us had about the pandemic, we found answers to in some very, very old Irish language texts. Next point to make is, you know, just this point about how the companies that did best were the ones that were already innovating. In Galway, we always say, you know, we don't have arts infrastructure, we don't have buildings. But that weakness became a strength because we were used to going outside. Look at that picture of, you know, typical Galway audience going out to build a model of uh, the Galway Quad in the university. The idea of must the show go on, uh, lots of people said actually it shouldn't. And I think that's very positive for us too. But the last point I'd make and conclude with is, and this has been said several times already, COVID was an ecological crisis. It's really important for us to see that when Irish theatre companies started to deal with COVID, they moved inevitably into ecological environmental work. And that wasn't a coincidence. It's really important to address that. And it also means we can see COVID as a rehearsal for climate change, for the biodiversity crisis, Rather than seeing these performances as compromises or these awful things we have to do to get by, they're actually methods we can apply in the future. And so what I would say is it's a really important conversation. Artists have really valuable views on this and they can contribute to that debate in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Patrick, for that um, inspiring and brilliant uh, address. I am not going to comment on it because I'm sure we're all going to want to, to talk about it afterwards. Let me, without more ado, 
introduce Ruth Barton, who's a member of the Royal Irish Academy. Uh, Ruth is Professor of Film Studies in Trinity College, Dublin. She has written widely on Irish cinema, and her most recent monograph is Irish Cinema in the 21st Century, was published in 2019. She has written critical biographies of Heidi Lamar and Rex Ingram, and she is a regular film critic, and we all hear you on RTE, Ruth, so thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, and actually, when um, when you were talking about when um, David was talking about broadcasting on on RT, I was having flashbacks to doing film reviews on Arena, sitting in my bedroom, um, talking into my iPhone, and you just didn't get the you didn't get it you didn't get that hit that you get from live performance. So there's something about that. Um, so I wanted to talk today as I, I, I was Diane gave me my top my my. Um, the headline for my uh, talk, and so I treated it like a, a student uh, preparing for an essay. So I have two research questions. Um, what effect then um, did uh, COVID have on cinema going in Ireland? Which is a, a you know this is sort of kind of factual approach, and and one of the things I have to say is when we're looking at this, oh, I, oh yeah, I do have time. Uh, when we're looking at this, is that. Um, we're really short of data on cinema going and on all aspects of film production and in, in particular the political economy of both filmmaking and film going. <clears throat> and this is something that I've struggled with throughout my entire career in writing on Irish cinema. At the same time, I'm reluctant to always guess at trends. And I'd, I, I, you know, I, I, I love to be able to prove some of the trends that we're talking about, um, but it's really hard to get that data. So years ago, when I did it, when I wrote my first book, Irish National Cinema, after a lot of kind of digging into the data, I concluded that most Irish people went to see an Irish film on television. They did not go to see it in the cinema. So I wanted to revisit some of that research with this idea of COVID in mind, which I hope you'll see. But the second sort of research question I was asking myself was, if the arts, humanities got us through COVID, what place did Irish cinema and television have in, in that process. And I hope to be able to address some of that um, as I proceed. I should say that one of the things we can prove is that we are a cinema going nation. Um, and we usually are somewhere at the top um, of the European um, average uh, of, uh, cinema, of, of audiences uh, for, for cinema going. Um, and we also have the highest number of cinema screens um, in Europe. So we have, um, uh, uh, one screen per 9,500 um, inhabitants here. In the UK, they have one screen per 15,000 inhabitants. And the European average is closer to one screen per 16,000 inhabitants. So we can go to the cinema um, and we do more than others. Um, so, But then, of course, COVID happened and we couldn't. Um, and just like everywhere else, cinemas closed from 16th of March 2020. They opened, they closed, there were restrictions, there were curfews, et cetera, et cetera. And they didn't reopen until the 23rd of January 2022, when almost all restrictions were lifted. So if cinemas, when cinemas closed, what else could you do? Well, the answer, and of course David's already talked about this, is you stay home and you watch television. But what did we watch on television? And what I find very interesting is and I know we have a panel on sport later, so I don't want to preempt what they're saying. We didn't, we watch sport on television. And if you go through um, RTE's top 20 programs uh, for the year 2021, um, you'll see that off the top of my head, um, apart from the late, late toy show, um, most people watched sport on TV. Nearly all the top programs were either, well, the Euros were on, so they're watching football. Um, there was, uh, they, they watched rugby. Um, they watched Gaelic games. Um, in fact, most of the, the top programs were, were GAA. Um, occasionally they dropped their interest in sport because Harry and, Me Harry and Meghan on Oprah, um, came in quite high. Um, but what they didn't do was watch, uh, in any large numbers enough to hit the statistics, Irish production, Irish arts productions, if you like. The only thing that registers is the series Kin, which some of you may have watched. It's just run, had its second season. It comes in at quite low down, and it's the only kind of home-generated arts that people were watching. 
but they were watching um, large amounts um, of television. The RT player, as I said here, saw a 48% increase in streaming in 2021 compared to the previous year. And that David's already said this, the most watched news program was the one on January the 5th, um, when the government considered closing schools for the month of January due to COVID-19. So as we've already discussed, people turned to TV for information. They turned to it for sport. But of course, they turned to it for normal people. And this is what I think, you know, one of the things I think we probably want to um, uh, consider a little bit more, which is why normal people, and I'll return to that. But here I've just put up some of the figures, the viewing figures um, for normal people on RTE. And you've got to remember that it was also simultaneously showing on the BBC, and many people would have watched it on the BBC. And all figures that we get don't include um, people uh, who watch through um, torrenting and other illegal uh, piracy methods. But what you could do, talking about tor torrenting <laughs> and other methods, was you could take out um, a subscription to a streaming service. And again, I haven't put the figures up, but we did. And the numbers of people taking out subscriptions to streaming services, particularly in the older age bracket. Now, I suspect there's a, there's a, you know, <laughs> I know in our home, we pay for Netflix and they watch it. Um, uh, although we've been told that they can't any longer. Um, but I think that, that probably the age group is in, in part due to who is actually putting the money on the table for the Netflix um, screening subscription. Um, and I'm going to come back to that. So one of the questions then is, and we're, we're, we're often told, oh, you know, um, COVID stopped people going to the cinema and audiences haven't returned. In fact, this is a myth. There's something of a myth. It's not an entire myth. But one of the things that if you study cinema going, cinema is always in crisis. Um, every time a new technology emerges, cinema's in crisis because people are not going to cinema because they're watching TV. People are not going to the cinema because of this or that and the other. People actually are still going to the cinema. I've just put up some of, some of on this, the trends, um, in, in the various, uh, uh, this is, you can see best the ones in the United States and Canada. You can see, you know, it kind of goes along, goes along, goes along, whoosh is down for COVID and is starting to rise again. But one of the things that's interesting about the figures for, for cinema going in the States is that they match the amount of releases. So what, what had happened was that during COVID, um, people couldn't complete their films. So in the immediate post-COVID period, there was a shortage of material. And so the shortage of material exactly matches the drop in cinema going. So once the material starts coming back in and Top Gun Maverick was nominated for Oscars, not because it's a brilliant film, but because people were so relieved that there was a film that was getting people back into the cinemas. So Top Gun Maverick, top movie in States, top movie here, the movie that's credited for getting people back into the cinemas again. But the other thing that most pundits discussed was that as well as the blockbusters, there was a shortage of kind of mid-range material, kind of averagey kind of stuff. And that's why people were not going back to the cinemas, not because they were actually afraid of going to the cinema. The only exception I quite like this was the United Kingdom, where there was an increase in cinema going, usually ascribed to the political crisis in the, in the UK, which you referred to earlier. And there is another theory that people go to the cinema to escape a crisis. Um, the depression in, in the States, for instance, or an up increase in cinema going. So thank you, Boris, if you are a UK film cinema owner. Um, there were some winners in this story. So, um, so, so, but what were people coming back to the cinema to see? Well, as for a start, um, were we ever watching Irish material in the cinema? And this is kind of going back to what I was saying. Unfortunately, no is the answer. We have the sixth lowest percentage of those countries reporting data on audiences for local films. So we are very bad at going to see our own films in the cinema. Um, and because, I mean, in fact, you know, we're talking about small numbers here. So, so every year, um, uh, the, the numbers increase and decrease according to the release of a certain film. So you, we're going to get for 2022 into 2023, we're going to get a, a huge increase because it's Ancalin Kuhn and it's Banshees. And so the numbers of people going to see an Irish film is going to, sh it will have shot up. Um, but year on year, very, f very few of the films, and this is, 
something that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to slightly glide over. It's something that concerns many of us discussing Irish cinema is you, the taxpayer, are subsidizing massively the Irish film industry. The Irish film industry is making a lot of films that are not Irish, but when they do make Irish films, you, the taxpayer, are not going to the cinema to see them. And in fact, there's a really big question as to where you, the taxpayer, are actually seeing them, if you're seeing them at all. And that is something that COVID has not, in fact, changed. But you, the Irish taxpayer, say you want to see Irish films. And this is, again, uh, comes from a recent survey where, where people were asked, do you want to see Irish films? And they said, Yes, we do, mostly. Yes, very much. And we want to watch Irish television. So, um, uh, so, so, so people want to see Irish films, but they're not going to see them in the cinema. And were they seeing them on TV? No is the answer. So there is a sort of, there's a kind of pool here of questions that arise that were always there before COVID. And this is what I'm trying, the point I'm trying to make. And so to ascribe all of this to COVID, is we're actually putting the blame in the wrong department, I think. Um, COVID simply made people focus on an issue that was already there. And we are returning to the same situation now in the post-COVID era. One of the, th the facts that I found very, very interesting when I was looking at this was we have returned in much larger numbers, in fact, to the cinema than have our other colleagues in other countries. So the last figures I was able to get were from November 19, uh, from November 2022. Admissions in this country to the cinema were up 178% um, on the equivalent period in the previous year. That's absolutely massive. So by comparison, it's 62% in the UK and in Europe, it's 56%. So think of that, 178 here, UK 62. Europe 56. So we went back in huge numbers, but what we can't see is why we went back in, su in, in such huge numbers. Is it because we have a very young population that goes to the cinema? Is it because that young population had been kept at home, as we were discussing, and really needed to get out and can afford to go to the cinema? Is it because that young population felt safer going to the cinema, perhaps, than going to a nightclub? I mean, who knows? It's really unfortunate not be, to be able to have that data to see why we particularly in this country re return to the cinema in such large numbers. But the question I think that um, I, I want to go back to then is the streamers, because look at this statistic. Top TV shows on Apple in 2022, Bad Sisters. And what we did, and again, I, I was looking at this for a different paper, is we turned to the streamers to see our Irish content. Um, and our Irish content was made to suit the streamers. So we've got a really significant, I think, turn going here where we're not going to RTE for our Irish um, fi screen fictions, if you like. We're turning to the screeners, streamers, <laughs> who in turn are giving us back a variation on Irish fiction that we wouldn't possibly have otherwise got. And I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but for those of you who have seen Bad Sisters, I think you'll understand why it wasn't on RTE. Um, and I, I, I kind of leave it at that. But that is um, a huge trend. And I think one of the things that I've been thinking about listening to today is, was COVID the last hurrah for RTE? And, you know, David's not here. <laughs> um, I think it may have been. I think it's probably the defining moment for RTE of what could have been, but what will in future be less and less as people consume more and more from streamers. And I think we need to be worried about that um, because I think what's been made for the streamers is different. And so uh, some to, to end up then um, with a few conclusions and questions. How much time am I doing? Enough time to just finish up. Thank you. So, so some conclusions and some questions. So, so the conclusions are that we have returned swiftly to cinema going post-COVID. The audiences have returned to their former practice of going to the cinema for Hollywood films and other major mainstream releases, possibly almost certainly due to the age of the cinema-going population. Audiences want to see Irish cinema and television. They will go to the cinema to see an Irish film if it is exceptional, such as The Quiet Girl, or if it has mainstream qualities and actors, such as Banshees. They will watch quality Irish programming in large numbers on streamers, but not on RTE. 
They will still watch terrestrial television for sport, light entertainment, and news in larger numbers, but I think we're looking at a very, very different constituency. Their viewing, and their viewing preferences and practices haven't fundamentally been altered by COVID. So here's the speculative end of the question. Was there a cinema of COVID? And again, we have you know, a lot of reports of people re-watching, apparently Richie Sun Rishi Sunak was really hooked on contagion um, and watched it repeatedly. Other people reported watching Children of Men, the dystopian uh, uh, a film about the end, of, the end of England fundamentally over and over again. But we don't have any data on that. I can find nothing to actually back it up. Because the other thing is, is escapism more desirable in, in, in a pandemic? Do we actually want the pandemic reflected back on us? Or do we want something completely different? And maybe that's one of the reasons for watching sport, because it's really not related to the pandemic. Are we going to get um, a COVID, is there a COVID cinema? Films about isolation and disease, films about surveillance. But, you know, this question is a rather basic one, but how many film stars will want to wear face masks on the screen? I think not. Um, so I think that COVID is almost going to, my feeling is, my guess is, COVID is going to slip by through the, the, through the fingers of history in terms of, of what we're watching on the big screen. Um, that's a feeling, it's a guess. COVID TV to finish up, um, normal people. What was it about normal people? Remember that it was actually made pre-COVID uh, and we watched it during COVID. I'm just going to throw out to finish up um, three reasons that I would speculate on as to why it became the COVID TV um, phenomenon that it was. One, because it was about intimacy and touch and that this brought people back into, into that world of intimacy and touch. Two, um, because very basically of its extraordinary high production values, um, because it was beautifully written, and that's got maybe nothing to do with COVID, but I think possibly we valued that more during COVID. We valued that artistry more during COVID because we had less, we wanted something good. We wanted something good to hold on to. And finally, because I think it brought us back in a kind of almost nostalgic way to when we did all watch TV together and when everybody, you know, went into work, <laughs> but everybody now, go, you know, goes into social media and discusses what they were watching on television before. So we, you know, we're considering the kind of national, um, dimensions of COVID. And I think that brought us back as a nation. It gave us a sense of being a nation to discuss, um, a TV series that most people, many people could relate to about being young, about growing up in the West of Ireland, about the experiences of, of, of kind of youthful, youthful coming together. So those are three reasons I'm just sort of suggesting there's this sort of almost nostalgia element to it. Um, did Irish screen arts get us through COVID? Actually, um, I fundamentally, I think probably not. I think it was other things that did. Um, and absolutely, finally, will we have a, a nostalgia cinema of COVID just as we have a nostalgia cinema of communism? Um, and actually, I think that's the most likely one that we will have. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ruth. Very stimulating questions there for us at the end. Let me um, turn quickly now to uh, Professor Daniel Carey, member of the Royal Irish Academy, University of Galway, who is also the Secretary for Polite Literature and Antiquities in this establishment and the Director of the Moore Institute in the University of Galway. Dan is Chair of the Irish Research Council, and from 2014-16, he was chair of the Irish Humanities Alliance. Dan, over to you. Thanks, Mary. Um, the proper segue, I suppose, from our first two talks are really to be uh, to consider maybe literature as a form of refuge during the pandemic or music, which Mary you alluded to at the start. Um, I'm going to talk about something different, which is really language and some observations about use of language and metaphor in particular during this period, but we might come back to those other questions. What people's reading practices were during the pandemic, I think, is very interesting. And, uh, you know, Philip was alluding to Zebald. I mean, other people had uh, recourse to Boccaccio or to Defoe or to Camus and others, things which are directly related in terms of subject matter. 
uh, and others which might have been more escapist in variety. The other thing we might want to think about collectively is just exactly what the meaning of the arts are or culture more generally during this period. There's a lot of referencing of, of it as having, you know, getting us through. And I kind of, I'd like to know what that means or entails. Um, are the arts curative in some way? Are they bound up with well-being? Do they help us psychologically? Um, is streaming just a way of killing time when you have no other ref access to people under normal social circumstances? Or is are, are the arts more generally and culture the meaning-making areas of, of the society in which we do some really serious and substantial work? I don't think we've really resolved our relationship to these questions or figured out actually what the definitions are. We probably have a little bit better sense of what science did during the pandemic, but maybe ultimately rather less about the arts. Uh, so with that preamble, I'm going to turn to something a little bit different, but uh, uh, broadly conceptually related, which as I say is the question of, of language. So um, on March 18th, uh, 2020, as COVID-19 spread across the United States, uh, Donald Trump <clears throat> declared himself to be a wartime president. Like many of his fellow leaders, he opted for metaphor amidst the crisis, enhancing his status while underscoring the severity of the situation. From the start, the pandemic has proved a fruitful ground for figurative language with metaphors, similes, um, uh, and other forms of uh, comparison defining in various different ways our relationship to a complex and, of course, a tragic reality. And politicians um, were not slow to exploit this resource, but the sheer density of the images that recur in this context, I think is worth some comment and consideration. And war definitely provided uh, an organizing image from the start. Um, it surfaced in speeches by Trump, by Emmanuel Macron, and Boris Johnson, for example. It's notably absent, at least as far as I've been able to detect in Angela Merkel's pronouncements, but there are historic reasons why a German leader would not reference war images. Um, Macron, to take an example, um, in an address to the French people on the 16th of March, repeated the phrase, nous sommes en guerre, five times uh, as a kind of refrain. Um, and on the first occasion, he, he used a kind of rhyming couplet for effect. Nous sommes en guerre, en guerre sanitaire, certes. Nous ne luttons ni contre une armée, ni contre une autre nation, mais l'ennemi est là, invisible, insaisissable, qui progresse, et cela requiert notre mobilisation générale. Now, the official translation of these remarks fails to capture the cadence and the drama that they conveyed. This is how they presented it on, on the French diplomatic website. We are at war, admittedly a health war. We're fighting neither an army nor another nation, but the enemy is there, invisible, elusive, and it's making headway, and that requires our widespread mobilization. Donald Trump identified the virus as an invisible enemy, combated, ostensibly, with military resolve. In a press conference in May 2020, Matt Hancock, the erstwhile UK health secretary, repeated this theme, commenting that history has shown that understanding an enemy is essential to defeating it and recommitting to this fight against our common foe. Now, there were critiques at the time uh, of the language of war that surfaced in various different sources, but I think there's more to it than just self-aggrandizement, which we can be cynical about. Um, war suspends ordinary life. It requires the energy and dedication of the society as a whole, and it sees the state at its most active, entitled to impose a lockdown, to declare an emergency, and to borrow unprecedented amounts to fund its needs. It is an occasion for the heroic. Wars can also be won, and victory over enemies declared, a scenario that coronavirus unfortunately does not particularly lend itself to. Well, what about Ireland? We see similar tendencies to embrace metaphor although the recourse to war as an organizing image doesn't seem to have been the intuition of Irish politicians, uh, as far as I can tell. Um, Leo Varadkar's remarks uh, when lockdown was announced on uh, March 12th were quite sober in their presentation with an emphasis on care, on loss, uh, on avoiding, uh, and he avoided altogether a, a more emphatic um, rhetoric, if I can put it that way. Now, in a statement on the Doyle in the, on the 23rd of April 2020, he did adopt more dramatic language as the disease and its impact by that stage had progressed. 
In his words, we have been battered by a wave of destruction, but as a people we have endured. And he warned at this stage, today our new enemy is complacency. When restrictions were extended in May 2020, uh, Varadkar uh, emphasized that we have not yet won this fight. Coronavirus, he declared, is cruel and inhumane. So he's anthropomorphizing the disease and giving it a kind of set of hostile motives that necessitated urgent action um, and indeed shared uh, sacrifice. Now, politicians didn't have a monopoly on this. Um, there was certainly a, a tendency to configure the predicament as a battle. That was widespread, uh, even in common speech. Doctors, nurses, hospital workers were fighting the disease um, and, and identified as being on the front line along with others in support capacities, people who are working as cleaners, supermarket workers, delivery people, etc. Now that image of the front line confirms their essential uh, contribution, even if they lacked in the early going uh, uh, adequate protective gear and were therefore much more at risk. Well, to turn to the UK, Boris Johnson, a former columnist, as we know, with writerly inclinations, um, displayed a rather remarkable penchant for metaphor during the crisis. Um, when he returned from hospitalization following his infection by COVID-19, he made a public address uh, in front of number 10 by offering the somewhat predictable claim that we are now uh, beginning to turn the tide without recognizing the unfortunate fact that tides have a habit of coming back in again. Um, he went on by draw drawing the following comparison. If this virus were a physical assailant, an unexpected and invisible mugger, which I can tell you from personal experience it is, then this is the moment we have begun together to wrestle it to the floor. Well, Johnson cast himself as a victim, an innocent bystander who did not invite his fate with rash behavior, assaulted by an unseen aggressor. Now, perhaps this is the only way to communicate vulnerability without dilating on the horrors of the disease or admitting culpability, given his habit of doling out handshakes at a rugby match in the lead up to his illness. Now, Johnson's next contribution uh, came when he resumed attendance at the daily press conferences um, uh, on this occasion on the April 30th. In his opening remarks, he declared, we are past the peak and we are on the downward slope. Well, no particular marks for originality uh, here with his metaphors, um, uh, but it was more apt than the title metaphor under the circumstances. But he then went on with some, with some rather baroque flourishes. We have come through the peak, or rather we have come under what could have been a vast peak, as though we have been going through some huge alpine tunnel. And we can now see sunlight in the pasture ahead of us. And so it is vital that we do not now lose control and run slap into a second and even bigger mountain. The lines on the graph, <laughs> what can I say? The lines uh, the, on the graphs that he was, that were accompanying this projected a massive, you know, infection rate and fatalities if no action uh, was taken. And that evidently suggested an alpine topography to him successfully tunneled under by the government's efforts and healthcare people. Um, so to incentivize the commitment to the strategy, he embellished things with this pastoral image, the kind of sunny uplands, but it really kind of descends into farce with the warning that there's another mountain looming inconveniently on the other side. Um, uh, it kind of reminds me a little bit of the, some of the early forays uh, before the virus took a major uh, grip in the UK, when he famously said that the, the imperative was to squash the sombrero. The man cannot resist a metaphor. Um, okay, so another context, the metaphors that would be familiar to us were, were ones of, uh, uh, of comfort. So in Johnson's case, this is a May 25th uh, press conference. He commended the uh, government uh, for wrapping our arms around every worker in this country with the furlough scheme. So the imagery, uh, which was offered in spontaneously in response to a question, was more convincing than uh, Matt Hancock's ill-judged uh, prepared remarks in the daily briefing uh, uh, 10 days earlier when he claimed that right from the start, we have tried to pro throw a protective ring around our care homes. Now, either this was disingenuous or an, an admission of complete incompetence, given that by his own figures, um, over 11,000 people had died in such facilities. Now, in multiple countries, including Ireland, um, another key metaphor of care came into play. 
As Leo Varadkar commented on the 17th of March, uh, 2020, at a certain point, we will advise the elderly and people who have long-term illness to stay at home for several weeks. We are putting in place the systems to ensure that if you are one of them, you will have food, supplies, and are checked on. We call this cocooning. Now, if Johnson indulged a taste in metaphor, and uh, he, for example, praised the staff uh, treating him at St. Thomas's Hospital for, quote, pulling his chestnuts out of the fire, uh, Donald Trump, largely confined himself to more familiar territory of hyperbole and self-praise. Uh, when Trump endorsed the curative powers of strong sunlight and injection of bleach, he engaged simultaneous, simultaneously in extreme literalism uh, and a metaphorical transfer uh, of the external to the internal. He mused about bringing light inside of the body, which you can do either through the skin or in some other way before speculating on the merits of bleach by injection inside or almost a cleaning. Now, this is pretty clear species of magical thinking, although some people, as we know, followed his advice. Um, so he's relying on the kind of disinfectant power of bleach, uh, which works as efficiently as Clorox does on a countertop when you ingest it. Um, I could give more examples, uh, but uh, I, I won't um, in, in that particular domain. Now, others were more subtle in their approach. Uh, uh, Jacinta Ardern, who you know earned a lot of points, I think, internationally for her approach and uh, for New Zealand's uh, uh, zero COVID um, uh, policy, um, took a very informal style in addressing the nation by Facebook. Um, on March 25th, 2020, she appeared in a COVID Q&A at home. Um, she was wearing a comfortable green sweatshirt and she apologized for the attire saying it can be a messy business putting toddlers to bed in reference to her nearly two-year-old daughter, Neve. The connection may have been innocent or predetermined, but it positioned the nation as an infant child cared for by a nurturing mother safe in a domestic space. Now, if we leave aside the sphere of politicians as a larger story here to be told, figurative language is a way of mediating our experience. We need metaphors and similes because comparisons are essential as a way of charting our way through densities of information and commentary to make things more real and assimilable. Um, I found it interesting at various stages in the pandemic, and I think of this particularly in the US context, of searching for some, something to, to peg the loss of life to. I was talking earlier about how abstract it is and we can't experience mass loss on that scale. So in the U.S., the initial tendency was to compare it to the loss of life, life in 9-11. Well, that was quickly equip, eclipsed. And then the Vietnam War and the loss of life there. So these are things known to be meaningful to Americans. Um, loss of life in World War II in other contexts was mentioned. Um, these are forms of comparison, ultimately, that are supposed to give us a relationship, a meaningful relationship. But I think even in the, in the domain of science, we can, we can see these traces. I mean, after all, the, the name of the, of the virus, um, Corona virus, is a metaphor for the crown-like appearance of the virus, um, of the pathogen. And elsewhere, as we know, charts and graphs uh, indicating infection rates and deaths uh, have dominated the presentations made by experts. But we know that these tallies are they're not the thing itself. They are approximations. They are representations. Uh, they give us some access to a reality, but they, but they aren't the reality itself. Um, so they, they serve a metaphorical purpose in that sense. Um, they stand for something else. Uh, Defoe actually is brilliant on this, uh, actually, in his account uh, in the Journal of the Plague Year. Um, and I think the same is true of the models on which uh, much of government thinking and planning was based. Um, and to give a, a final example of the metaphorical response, um, I'm thinking of, of uh, uh, Governor Cuomo in New York, who warned in 2020, the tsunami is coming. So throughout the crisis, uh, metaphor has been hard at work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. <clears throat> that was, I think we will all agree, uh, a fascinating um, presentation, as were the presentations from Patrick 
and from Ruth, um, each coming from a different way to make us realize the power of creativity and of language. Um, I'm going to open it up now for questions and observations. Nobody coming for, yes, right. Gentleman there in the, thank you. Uh, firstly, thank you very much for uh, all of the very, very interesting presentations. This question is uh, for Professor Barton. Um, at the very end, you mentioned that there's the potential, you think, for a nostalgia cinema of COVID in a similar way that there was a nostalgia cinema of communism. And I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit. I find it very interesting, particularly that the nostalgia cinema of communism is so often about the uh, lost potential, um, uh, a solidarity that doesn't exist anymore, um, and egalitarianism, and in what way you would see that in, uh, would it be the kind of the, the potential, the solidarity that existed early on in lockdowns and so on and so on? Yeah, um, I, I think so. I think what, um, you know, I've already heard people, um, and I think we probably all have heard people being nostalgic about COVID. I mean, we, it, it is a thing. Um, and what mostly people seem to be referring to is the simplicity of life, that all the kind of distractions were stripped away and community, that we were in uh, small, uh, small bubbles. And they were you know, clearly not remembering all the rest of the stuff that went on. And I think that as we progress into an ever complicated, more complicated society, exactly as you say in that, in the sort of simi similar of, uh, cinema of, um, uh, Ost nostalgie, if you like, whatever, that they're looking back at a time where everybody had an apartment, everybody had a job, um, decisions were made for you. And I think that, I mean, I think it would be very, very interesting that decisions were made for you point. If that were to become a trend, that's a very, that's a very dangerous trend. Um, but that's what I feel is the most likely, because I think, as I said, I don't think we're going to get a load, load of films about people saving lives in hospitals, for instance. Um, but I, th I think that's what we're going to go back to, whether we go back overtly in terms of the actual storyline or covertly in terms of us detecting that nostalgia in other stories, I, you know, I don't know. But I have a kind of sense that that's, that's where we'll go. Yeah. Thank you. Did any of the other panelists want to comment on that specific one? No. Right. Okay. Um, I have. Yes. Yes. Thank you. I will get to you, Luke. Hi, Marta Bustillo from UCD Library. Um, a question for all three of you, maybe. I have, I am a very avid listener to RCE radio. And through the day, I've had these two phrases in my mind, and I blame Philip for this, by the way, because he mentioned follow the science. So follow the science on the one side, and then on the other side, uh, very often when there are ads on RTE about things that are supported by the Arts Council, they say uh, supporting artists, supporting us. So follow the science and the supporting artists. My sense through the pandemic in Ireland was that all of a sudden the science was the important bit and the arts and the social sciences and everything else had to take a back seat. But of course now that the dust is starting to settle, we're seeing, and you, you have very elo eloquently presented the central role that the arts had, and I know Philip mentioned this morning that maybe more contribution from the social sciences would have been important. So do you think that maybe the pandemic has helped us in see that the arts and the humanities and the social sciences are not just adjuncts? I mean, or am I just being too optimistic? It's for all three of you. Yeah, but Thank you very much for that question. We're happy to offer some thoughts on that. Um, yeah, I mean, a few ways of, of, of responding to that. I mean, the, in, the, in, broadest, in the broadest terms, I would argue, well, often the question is presented in the following terms. Um, if we've learned one thing, dot, dot, dot. And you get various different answers to that. Um, it's usually, if you take the Irish government's response and then back 2030, what we've learned is two things. We've learned vaccines. Well, that seems pretty obvious. The other thing is something called behavioral science, which is rather limited and it's pulling levers and you can see why people in government rather like that. I would make a bolder argument, which is that if we've learned one thing or one thing we should have learned is that the pandemic 
is a, I'll put it this way, it's about philosophy. It's about the order of values. That is the ultimate conf conf confrontation that we've encountered. And to put it in the simplest terms, you can have the best vaccine in the world. If nobody takes it, you've got nothing. So ultimately, you're dealing with a human situation, and it's about those who are on the front line, those who have to shelter, those who require care, what our responsibilities are to one another, why we should act on collective motivation rather than individual motivation. That's what it's about. So in a very profound sense, this is about the humanities. And if we do not enlist those disciplines in our relationship and thinking about this, we've got nothing and we've learned nothing. Um, <clears throat> to make a couple of other quick points, just about your, 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 your question about following the science, I agree with you. Uh, and we were talking about it earlier, about the ways in which that has to be pluralized, clearly. I mean, the lessons here is ultimately we're dealing with forms of probabilistic reasoning. That's a rather sophisticated concept to get across. We don't deal with certainty and knowledge. We deal with models, which are projections, which are based on assumptions. They're the best we can do. They have to be interrogated. They often vary in interesting ways from country to country for reasons that also invite us to think about cultural difference. Um, so I think it's, we need to move more, I think more in that direction. And if we did, I think we'd have a little bit more sophisticated um, uh, take away from this ordeal and experience. Thank you, Dan. Patrick? Yeah, thanks for the question. So I, I've been thinking quite a bit about this point about did the pandemic, you know, did we get through the pandemic because of the arts? And partly following on from some of the discussion this morning, I think that's probably true for people who were already had the arts in their lives. But, you know, no more than with the ensuite mm -hmm. bedrooms, you know, the, the arts got us through the pandemic if you had a machine, if you had Wi-Fi, if you had phone credit, if you had space and time. And that wasn't true for everyone. And so I think, again, thinking about the lessons we can learn, um, one of the reasons I wanted to show you that picture of those thousands of people in our square is to illustrate the tradition in this country of participative arts, where you don't have to pay for it, you don't have to be a professional, but you can participate in making art. And when people went outside, you know, there were people who, who saw Lehan Zasona on in this year who had never been inside a theater, but they got it and they found it really moving and powerful. Um, there are people who participated in the big chapel for whom it was their first experience of performing too. And so I think that the comment was made earlier that if we want to address some of the underlying problems, we have to address inequality. I think one of the inequalities that we have to address is to really be aware that the access to the arts that we take for granted is first of all precarious, but secondly, it's not universal at all. And if the pandemic has shown us anything, to go back to Dan's point, it's that everybody deserves to have that equality of access. So that would be the big lesson for me. Thank you, Patrick. Yeah, I think that one of the things that came out of the pandemic was the swift mobilization of the arts to advocate for itself. And one of the, the narratives that emerged from, the, from COVID very, very swiftly globally was that the arts had stopped, that, that production had stopped, theaters had closed, cinemas had closed, um, and in terms of my discipline, filmmaking had stopped. And this, I th various arts organizations and um, pressure groups took that advantage to make a case that they had already been making for greater subsidy of the arts. And, and the very specific um, consequence of that in this country was the, was the basic in income guarantee scheme for, for the arts, which is a direct consequence of that pressure group coming forward and saying, look what happens when artists can't make their, their art. So in a very, very specific way, I think it did work um, in, in the favor of a wider kind of um, public debate about the arts. But what, as you know, you're both saying, what is unprovable is that the arts got us through COVID. Um, just as it's fairly unprovable, apart in kind of quite specific cases, of keeping kids in school, for instance, the arts are good for you. Um, or that the arts give us a sense of national identity. All these things are things that, in the kind of echo chamber that we're in, we agree on. But actually, if you take it out of that echo chamber, it, it is not something that we can be as sure about, perhaps, as we might like to be. Thank you. Uh, Luke. 
Yeah, I wanted to go back to Dan's very interesting discussion of the symbolism and imagery that was used and raise an issue which is the negative imagery which was associated with wearing masks. And I raise this from a personal experience. Early on in the pandemic, I posted on, in the days when I was still on Twitter, I have given it up for good reasons since then. I posted a, a photograph of myself wearing my mask and I got a very angry, abusive message saying, do you want to be muzzled like a dog? And there was a lot of talk about muzzling and suppression of speech associated with mask wearing, quite inappropriate actually, and very negative. Uh, so I, I thought that was an interesting dimension of the discussion and I wondered, what you as an expert in symbolism and imagery would have to say about it. That seems to be for you, Dan. Yeah, thank you very much. That's, that's such an interesting question. And it takes us back to some things that we discussed earlier. I mean, one of the difficulties, I suppose, with masking was that it wasn't the initial advice. And there was some difficulty, even for those that had, thought it had some utility, wanted if anybody would be competent in doing it and so forth. Then there were different uh, qualities of masks that were deemed to be uh, useful. And that seemed, it's almost a question of, of changing advice, which is perfectly legitimate. <laughs> we live in time, after all. Uh, but then was used as part of a critique by those who felt that this was some kind of engineered practice, which would only escalate in terms of the freedoms that it would abridge. Um, yeah, I mean, the imagery is very powerful. Um, I think there's the, a lot of the photography was not very good. I mean, those of us who were teaching online would have the curious experience. Then if you began teaching students in person and mask came off of encountering different human beings you didn't entirely recognize. Uh, so online we could manage it, but in person if, with masks, um, they change our relationship, uh, fundamental forms of so sociality that, that we expect and engage in. There are differences worldwide. Uh, in Asia, which, which are notable. So I think all those things are, are powerful. I do come back to, I mean, okay, what everyone says about Trump uh, is a gift for um, staging his performances, but the, the, the gesture of removing the mask and declaring himself to have triumphed personally uh, in a strongman pose over COVID was uh, rather notable, shall we say. Um, so there's, there's various different uh, forms of, of of symbolism and of imagery and of, of performance that I think are really intrinsic to people's relationship and to those who identified with Trump in that moment, a very powerful one. So uh, to take off the mask is a form of liberation. To have it on is a form of restraint. Um, I think politically, I didn't make this, this comment because it takes us in a slightly different direction. I felt that there was a little bit of a problem in the framing of it, particularly in the UK, but you see it also in the US which is if you frame it around questions of personal freedom, one of the striking things is nobody wants less freedom. I never met anybody who wants less freedom. If you frame it around that, you're, you're, you're only ever going to be in a losing proposition. Generally, that wasn't how it was done in Ireland. Much more emphasis on community care, relationship to older people, your older relations. And that I think was a more powerful and compelling argument. But all those things I think are, are, are culturally contested and, our, and, way, and weaknesses are sought out within, uh, within, within the structure of images and languages that the people who, who would wish to diminish a, a level of public support for this, I, I think we're re ready to exploit. Anybody else like to come in? Uh, hello. Yep. This is a bit of a strange thing because I'm part of the AV team shooting this, but uh, it's just really interesting uh, that I just felt the need to ask a question. This is more targeted uh, towards you, Ruth, but uh, sort of um, bringing out to everybody about uh, interesting about the way you say about in the future there might be sort of nostalgia about the uh, pandemic. But one question I'd have is, do you think there'd be an uptick in film sort of addressing it like an aside? And I bring this up because in the mid to late 2000s in India, in Bollywood, there's a surprisingly high amount of films uh, relating to 9-11. And in India, there was actually, they had their own terrorist attack called 26-11. But instead, there's very few films relating to that, but there's a high amount of films relating to 9-11. So I guess my question would be, do you think there would be films sort of in a way to try and address like a tragedy 
or a, a long period of suffering. Um, I hope I answered. I hope I asked that correctly. No, you know, thanks, yeah. and it's great that you asked the question. I think it's a really good question too, because one of the things that we've learnt from film history is that we don't have the film about the event until quite a long time after the event. So we know, for instance, that the Vietnam War didn't appear on film until quite substantially afterwards. And the same with 9-11. And 9-11 only really started to come through on film quite a bit after the, the event. So I think you're really right to ask that question. And it could well be that we're not ready yet to make the pandemic film and that we need that space in time. And for, But I would also say for certain narratives to fall in place even before we're ready to make that film, because we need the structure of a certain set of narrative trigger points, almost, if you like. And then we, we may indeed make the same film over and over again. Um, uh, or, it, you know, it could be long-form TV, actually, perhaps more likely, because the sense of um, claustrophobia is more available, in a way, on a television screen than in a, than the open space of a cinema. I think it's a really good question. I think you're probably completely right is that time will pass before we start making those those film stroke TV. Yeah. We need we need a mic. I have a, a follow on. Just some of the medical series have actually covered it, like it, just in a clinical context. You know, like I think it might have been Casualty or Grey's Anatomy. And it was just so up to date. I was fascinated. <laughs> but that's, that's just a little contribution. Yeah, well, also, I mean, I think we're going to have to ask where the superheroes are as well, because one of the one of the problems post 9-11 was the superheroes couldn't stop 9-11. And that led to a loss of authority for superheroes. So one of the questions is going to be, why did the doctors you know, not solve? Or where's the amazing scientist who solved COVID? So in a sense, possibly our narratives aren't quite ready for, for that. <laughs> Um, we have time, I think, for one more question. Uh, Philip, you wanted to come in, or one more observation? No, no it, it is a question, um, okay. but, but formed in an observation. So having kind of participated in the scientific theatre, actually, of, and I don't mean that in a pejorative sense, I mean the performance of trying to explain. Um, one of the things that strikes me about, I thought the question that I want to ask is, how, is there a mistake we've made? And the mistake we've made is to privilege the exploratory or explanatory power of the sciences, only to realize in that theater that the explanations are inadequate and incomplete and materialist. We can understand how the material world works and therefore our lives will be better. And that's kind of a Faustian pact. That is not, is this, the question I have is the step that we have to make now is to consider what are the exploratory and explanatory powers of our different disciplines and what's the nature of the audience and I, 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 I guess that's my question is is there not a step we need to take now as an academy about what is it we're useful for um, or what is it we're practicing and are the differences and therefore, how the state and the public supports them less than who would think. <coughs> Patrick. Yeah, I might take that one. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I heard you use the word dramaturgy earlier to talk about the kind of, or the choreography of how you do things um, in that context. Uh, I mean, it's such a complicated question uh, about how we present these things, but I actually think a good example is how theater is being used to address climate change. So the observation is often made, you know, if it was enough for us to hear from scientists, then we would have sorted out climate change in 1992, but it wasn't. So why was that? And so what a lot of ecological theater involves is bringing people either emotionally or physically and ideally both into contexts where, you know, they don't need to think about the physics of it, they can actually feel it, experience it in terms of heat or weather or animals or whatever it might be. And that has proven to be an effective way of allowing people to engage with it. And so, you know, in the case of, of COVID, I mean, we couldn't do that because of theater perhaps, but one of those examples I was trying to uh, talk about a volcano that puts us in, in a, an isolated room for an incredible dance performance. 
it really did bring home to me when I saw it, what we had lost out on through COVID in a way that, you know, a scientist could have told me, but it wouldn't have hit me emotionally in the way that it did. So to answer your question, I think that what the arts and the humanities can do is we can provide access to understanding, we can provide knowledge and we can provide meaning in a way that is complementary to the scientific um, and sometimes even potentially contradictory to the scientific, but, but part of the human experience that we all use to form our understanding of who we are in the world. Right, we have reached the end of our appointed time, Diane. There is one other lady wants to ask a question. Am I allowed? We need to close now, do we? Okay, so we're going to close. I'm going to make a couple of comments. I think that um, <clears throat> pulling it together, um, and Philip asked the question and Patrick answered it, uh, there is no point ever, I think, in trying to make an economic case for the arts uh, and humanities. It's all about what we have been talking about this afternoon. It's about the answer to isolation, it's creativity, it is, uh, unfortunately, inequality has come up. And the answer to did the arts and get us through the pandemic, I would have said yes at the beginning, but you're now putting it back and saying it wasn't equal for everyone. We leave it at that, Diane. You'll be pulling it all together, I know. So thank you very much for our panel. Thank you. Thank you.